Meyer Amschel Bayer uh, schooled his five sons in the art of money, and when they were of age and had learned to trade, he sent them out to the financial capitals of Western Europe and set up their own central banks with headquarters there in Frankfurt. And uh, that's how the the name Frankfurt, I mean, the name Rothschild got started. Uh, I told you they finance all wars. Uh, there was a newspaper called the Labor Leader, published on December 19th, 1891, on the subject of the Rothschilds. And, and in case you can't read it, I'll read it for you. It says, This blood-sucking crew has been the cause of untold mischief and misery in Europe during the present century and piled up is its, its prodigious wealth chiefly through fomenting wars between states which ought never to have quarreled. Wherever there is trouble in Europe, wherever rumors of war circulate and men's minds are distraught with fear of change and calamity, you'll be sure that a Rothschild is at his game somewhere near the region of the disturbance. So they knew back then that, that, that they financed all wars. They, they financed the the French Revolution, uh, they financed the Bolshevik Revolution, World War I, World War II. Uh, in fact, uh, they made a, a big pile of money when Napoleon was at uh, Waterloo. Back in those days, uh, the Rothschilds had the, the, the finest intelligence organization in the world. And so they had a spy overlooking the Battle of Waterloo. and. In London, at the uh, stock exchange, uh, they, they had bonds that they called consoles. But the, uh, the price of the console was based on the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo. And uh, if, if uh, Napoleon had won, that meant the power, uh, the power of Europe would, would be in the hands of the French. If he lost, the power would be in the hands of the Great Britain. So uh, the people trading on the stock exchange were betting one way or another, and uh, Nathan Rothschild had his usual post there on the floor, and uh, so his spy could see that Napoleon was fixing to lose. So he got on his speedy horse and rode to the coast, got on a fast sailing ship, sailed over to England, got on another speedy horse, rode to London, uh, told Nathan that... Uh, that the that Napoleon was fixing to lose the war. Uh, now those the people on the stock exchange were always trying to break uh, Nathan's code. He would use signals, and so he gave a signal, maybe flipped an ear or something, and and everybody thought that was that meant uh, either buy or sell. Well, he they they figured out then that that uh, in fact. There was a statement made that uh, probably uh, Napoleon won, and so the price of consoles went to the went to the bottom. And when they got down to about a nickel on a dollar of their former value, Nathan gave another signal. All of a sudden, his agents on the floor bought up all the consoles. And ten ten hours later, the news came through that Napoleon had lost. The price of consoles skyrocketed to the ceiling. When they hit the peak, the Rothschilds sold out. And so this was very common. They, they controlled everything. In fact, every morning of the week at 9 o'clock, there's a company called N.M. Rothschild, Nathan Meyer Rothschild, that happens to be located in the city of London. And they, every morning at 9 o'clock, they established the price of gold worldwide. Now, if, if they set the price of gold, can you imagine that they tell their agents around the world that we're going to raise the price or we're going to lower the price, and so they buy and sell based on this insider information? You bet they do. Let's talk about the uh, War of Independence when the United States uh, decided to split from the United Kingdom. Uh, thank you very much. The Rothschilds had been trying to set up a, a central bank in the uh, United States, and at one time they were granted a 20-year charter. When that expired, they 
failed to renew that charter. And, uh, but they were having trouble setting up their central bank. And so the Rothschilds formed a group that they were great at forming secret groups. In this case, they formed a group called the Knights of the Golden Circle. The Knights of the Golden Circle quickly spread all across the United States. And uh, in fact, all the members of the Confederate government were members of the Knights of the Golden Circle. All the members of Lincoln's cabinet were Knights of the Golden Circle, except Lincoln and Secretary of Treasury. So the object was for the Knights of the Golden Circle to spread out, to uh, spread, uh, split the United States in half, and then have it quarrel, and then finally go to war. And when the uh, North and South had uh, killed off as many soldiers as they could, or ran out of ammunition, or, or all their guns were used up, and both the North and the South were heavily in debt, the Rothschilds had convinced the British government to put an army in Canada and another one in Mexico and convinced the French and Spanish governments to put armies in Mexico. And when the United States was at its weakest point and in heaviest in debt, these armies would then come in and take over the United States and bring it back under the control of the crown. Well, Lincoln saw this coming. He contacted the Tsar of Russia and asked for his help. The Tsar of Russia quickly agreed. He sent uh, part of his navy to anchor off the shore of New York City, part to anchor off the Gulf of Mexico, and the other to anchor off of the coast of California. And he notified the the British, the French, and the Spanish, if, if, they, if their troops crossed the borders into the United States, that Russia was going to take the side of the North and do battle with all those nations. Well, this kept them out. And uh, Lincoln needed money to finance the war. And in those days, his only source was Nathan Rothschild in London, who was charging 24 to 36% interest on the money. And so he went to the Secretary of Treasury and, and told the Secretary of Treasury to print about uh, $4.4 million worth of paper money. They called them greenbacks because the backs were green. And they put this in circulation to pay federal debt and was uh, accepted as a monetary exchange and was, became very successful. And the Rothschilds saw this happening, and they could not allow any nation, particularly a fledgling nation like the United States, to establish their own money and credit. So they took one of the Knights of the Golden Circle spies, a fellow named John Wilkes Booth. He was first assigned to kidnap Lincoln. Uh, that failed, so he then decided to kill Lincoln, and so. Uh, I'll get to that when I get to Lincoln. But uh, I talk, talked about the, the five Rothschild sons. They set up banks in, in Western Europe. Amschel went to Frankfurt, or stayed in Frankfurt with the old man. Nathan went to London, uh, Jacob to Paris, Carl to Naples, and Solomon to Vienna. Now, there's a, the phenomena of the, uh, <clears throat> The city of London, that's the, the city, is, it means something. The Vatican happens to be a sovereign nation that is just located within Rome and in Italy. It's sovereign, it, it's not part of Rome, it's not part of, of Italy. Likewise, the city of London is a sovereign nation of 577 acres of land, and it's... Uh, at one time was completely surrounded by a rock wall. Uh, it has a police force of about 6,000. The, the total population is about 5,500. Now the, the reason they have all those police is that's where the financial centers of the world are centered. That's where the Lords of London is located. That's where the Bank of England is located, the Central Bank of England. Uh, the large trading companies have headquarters there. The, the largest uh, 
insurance companies in the world have headquarters there. Every bank that deals in the United Kingdom has a branch bank there. And the large police force is there to protect their money. Now, if the Queen of England wants to cross through the city of London or go into the city for some reason, they, her assistants notify the mayor of the city of London who meets her at the boundary. He escorts her to where she wants to go because that is a state visit, one nation to another. When she's through, he escorts her out. And uh, so that's where the uh, elite, the core of the world finances, that's, that is their, their nation. Now I mentioned the Queen of England in uh, about 1830 or so, she gave the East Indian Company a sole monopoly to pick up opium in India and deliver it to China and to hook the uh, Chinese peasants on, on opium. Well, when the uh, Chinese rulers would protest, the British Navy would conveniently anchor off the coast and start bombarding. And it actually led to two wars, they call the Opium Wars of 1839 and 1842. So you have the Queen of England directly involved in the dealing of opium. It's my belief that all of the elite, the inner core, are directly involved in the sale of illicit drugs worldwide and certainly in the laundering of the money from illicit drugs. <coughs> now let's get into Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was shot at 10.15 p.m. on April 14, 1865, died the next day at 7.22 a.m. Uh, he and his wife and uh, Clara Harris and Henry Rathbone uh, were sitting in the uh, president's box in the Ford Theater to see the play Our American Cousin. Uh, John Wilkes Booth, uh, at the first intermission, got to chatting with the guard. There was a single guard named Parker outside of uh, Lincoln's uh, booth and uh, he was there to guard Lincoln but uh, John Wilkes Booth asked him to go join him at the saloon next door and have a, a drink and, and he left enough money on the table for that, that guard to uh, spend the night rest of the evening drinking and he never returned to his post. John Wilkes Booth then went up to the state box, opened the back door, shot Lincoln in the back of the head with a single shot Derringer, jumped down to the stage below, broke a bone in his foot, uh, but limped across the stage. He pulled his long knife and, and, uh, to keep people away from him and he escaped out the back door. He and his companion rode their horses out of town and throughout through the countryside and ended up at a uh, tobacco farm and uh, they were hiding out in a uh, tobacco warehouse well the soldiers followed them there and uh, so the soldiers were in front of the barn and, and they said if you don't come out we're going to shoot you and we're going to burn the barn down well the soldiers thought there were just two people in the barn actually there were three John Wilkes Booth snuck out the back door, got on his horse, rode to the river nearby, got on a British ship, sailed to London. By the way, when he killed Lincoln, he had in his possession $6,800 in cash. He was an out-of-work actor. Uh, about three weeks before he killed Lincoln, he was in London to pick up his money from either the Rothschilds or agents of the Rothschilds. And uh, so he sailed to London from there. He probably picked up his retirement money and sailed to Bombay, India, where he spent the next 14 years, died of natural causes, 14 years after he killed Lincoln. Now, the person that killed Lincoln, they, they got these two soldiers that they'd shot and, and the one they called, uh, I mean, one they called uh, John Wilkes Booth uh, had red hair. Uh, 